Welcome to The Growth Show with Matt Lindsay, where we discuss growth strategies both for business and a personal perspective, discussing all kinds of businesses, growth strategies, technology, investment strategy, and much more. We are meeting with entrepreneurs, investors, app developers, and property developers. Our vision is to help 10,000 business owners grow their businesses. Introducing our host, Matt Lindsay. Matt is a former banker and corporate financier. He now spends his time building his own companies organically and through acquisition, as well as raising capital for other businesses. Matt works with a wide variety of entrepreneurs and investors. Good morning and welcome to The Growth Show. Today's guest is Dave Hartnett, who is the founder and CEO of Mountbatten Estates. Good morning, Dave, and welcome. How are you? Oh, hi, Matt. How are you doing? You're right. I'm very well, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me today. No, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Well, we've known each other for, it must be five or six years, something around that time. that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I'm pretty sure we ended we ended up in a in a in a pub after a networking event or something similar where we met and had had a we few did. drinks. We certainly did, yeah. Um, uh, I I think we're we're both quite uh, avid when it comes to networking and growing our network and meeting new people and expanding. And in fact, actually, I think he was uh, a mutual friend to uh, as well, uh, a chap called Ray, who introduced us. In, uh, actually, you're right. Yes, it was Ray McLennan. That's right. That's yeah. right. Shout yeah. out to Ray. Hope he's good. Yeah. <laughs> cool so so thank you for joining us today and we, we we've obviously kept in touch over the years and what I've been really really impressed with and yeah you, you must be quite quite proud of your achievements that you've made is is over the last 18 months or so you've made some huge huge progress in terms of your portfolio and and building building that up from the property side so that that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about in terms of, you know, the process that you went through to achieve this. But first things first, if we could start at the beginning, just just to give a bit of background and narrative in terms of your journey, your career today, the things that you've done um, and, and, and then how, how you've got to where you are today. That would be really, really helpful, Dave. All right. Uh, sure. So I'll um, I'll start. Um, once I finished uni. So I got a uh, degree in IT um, from Hertfordshire University um, back in, I think it was roughly around 2005. Um, I'm ashamed to say I actually never got an, an, IT, an IT job. I was more interested in property. Um, so um, yeah, I went into to property. I was uh, an estate agent for a few years. Um, and then wandered into investment banking for a bit. So I was a trader in the city. Uh, and then uh, around 2007, 2008, we had the crash. So that kind of brought me back down to uh, a level of pegging again. So I'm back into property. Um, and yeah, I was, I was quite successful. I, I ran my own branches. And then that led me on to owning my own estate agents, um, which I ran very successfully for a good few years. Uh, we had, uh, I'd actually bought an estate agent that was running for close to 25 years. So it had a, quite a large lettings book, I believe about 100 plus properties. Um, we built up the sales and then I built up the land and new homes development as well. So we were um, acquiring sites for developers and effectively once they started building them out, we used to sell them off plan via the estate agents. Okay. Um, that kind of led me on to thinking, well, you know, I'm finding the site, they're building it out and they're turning this piece of land, this, this ugly looking building into something quite, quite nice. And, uh, you know, they're, they're making quite a large chunky change in the space of 24 months. And I thought, you know, maybe I, I, I need to kind of seriously look at this. And I've always, I've always been in and out of property, you know, buy to let or HMOs or rent to rent. And, you know, that kind of led me on to the, the whole kind of development side of things. Okay. Um, so so that, it, that, that was kind of a natural evolution of the kind of skills that you'd learned through 
doing some smaller projects and did, have you retained those assets that you bought at that time what, what was the strategy at that time um so yeah so at the time i i was quite ambitious so i i needed to invest into a few other little um side businesses i was i was starting off so i actually sold the, the assets um and I knew there was there was a big there was a big gap in my knowledge as well. You know, I wanted to do much bigger projects, but you know, I I didn't I I, I lacked the the, the skill set and the knowledge, and and the experience to be fair for doing big projects. So I needed to to start from from square one really. And you know, I've 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 done a lot of um, Tony Robbins personal development. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and I I, know, I knew I needed to try and improve my 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 uh, property knowledge. So I went on quite a few probably courses and mentorships and masterminds and to be fair there isn't really anyone out there in the UK I haven't actually studied with at some point okay and, uh, and that all re really kind of led me up to um you know setting up the business and and and, and really put, applying all that knowledge that I, I gained over the last few years okay and and in terms of going through that kind of formal training process because as as you well know in my property activity I I haven't actually done any formal training I've done it purely on the hop which is 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 obviously the the kind of opposite end of the spectrum where you you know you make some mistakes and you learn from those mistakes um is there any recommendations for anyone who is considering getting started and and you know things to look out for things to avoid in terms of choosing a trainer because i know that it can be you know there's, there's good and bad in that world aren't there a hundred percent there is yeah um i'm 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 a real advocate for um having a mentor in your life you know i've got yeah. different mentors doing different things uh, i've got a, a mentor for my health uh, i've got a different one for my my uh, my money my finance another one for property um you name it so uh, i'm i i really do believe in 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 the, the process of going with a mentor, not making the mistakes that you should be making. You know, they've got a lot of experience, knowledge, context, you name it, that they, they can pass on to you. But what I have found is if I was doing it over again, I probably wouldn't have a mentor right straight away once I started all the property education. I'd, I'd probably do a few more courses, try and apply some of that knowledge because what I found by getting a mentor on a mentor too early they're obviously gonna. They, they obviously cost a you know a fair amount of money, and I wasn't actually getting that real value from that because sure. at the beginning, I would say probably the first few months, my main issues was um, I, I, did, I had a lack of of supply of good quality properties or mm -hmm. a lack of properties that I could get to analyze or or get to stack. So I, if I was doing it again, I'd probably spend at least six to nine months on building up my business building the relationships trying to get a, a pipeline of sites in 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 the system off market because i was chasing on market stuff and as you know you know none of that stuff ever works so um, <laughs> <laughs> exclusive here we've got an ex-agent telling us it doesn't work on market <laughs> yeah 100 percent. yeah i'll go on the record for that there's I, there's, I, there's, my, there's my clickbait headline <laughs> <laughs> indeed uh oh god um also i would say if uh, what yeah one 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 mistake was um you know at the beginning this whole office to resi was really hot and um i was chasing that for way too long um yeah. not realizing that people were being pumped out from these courses um there was even you know times where i turned up at, uh, at the same site as as the mentor who was giving the course they were bidding against their own mentees wow. honestly wow. and um i yeah uh, and then obviously after a while these vendors knew the value of office buildings so they're actually putting the pd in place themselves and then selling it with with, with the consent in place well it because because originally when some of the guys that i i know of and we, we, we mutually know and knew um were doing that there was obviously a, an arbitrage so effectively you could buy a you know 150 200 pound a square yeah. foot and then sell at six seven hundred up to a thousand pound a square foot but obviously, yeah. as 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 that evolved, yeah, that 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 arbitrage was lost, wasn't it? So there was less margin in in those projects. Indeed, I would say, like anything, 
you know, the whole office to, to Resi PD came out, when was it, Rough, roughly around 2013. Yeah. There was a very short window where probably you had about two or three years to maximize um, that opportunity. Yeah. And they probably by about 16, 17, everyone, every Tom, Dick and Harry knew about it. So they're all chasing it. And by that time, the boat had sailed. So you missed that opportunity. Yeah. Actually, while we're on that subject, it might be uh, quite a good uh, point just to mention. You know, I do a lot, a lot with planning um, okay. and change of use and PD and planning, you name it. Um, there's, there's been quite a few interesting changes to the use class order in the last year. Absolutely. Um, and there's been quite a few interesting changes with the government allowing PD for going up above either residential properties or commercial buildings, you name it, to allow it an extra two floors. Um, and then the, you've got this new use class order called Class MA, yeah. where it basically takes everything in Class E. And Class E is a, a kind of accumulation of... Historically, it used to be A1 and A2 and A3, which was your retail, your um, restaurants, uh, your financial services, um, your B1A, which used to be offices, and your D1 and T D2, which I guess maybe used to be um, nurseries, dentists, doctor surgeries, that type of thing. So that's sure. all in, in, in one super class E now, as I like to call it. Um, and you can take everything in class E, use class MA to convert it to resi under PD. Yeah. This is really in you know very 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 early stages there isn't actually a lot of people out there who know about it and second of all um it's definitely from the conversations i'm having uh, i'm having with the um with, with, with the case officers the planning officers in um in these councils they're not they haven't actually fully got their head around it as well so all i'm trying to say is there's a really good opportunity if everyone if anyone wants to kind of look down that avenue if they wanted to look at something that's quite new that still has plenty of opportunity. Maybe a lot of vendors out there don't actually know the value of what they have. But, you know, if you can learn the planning system, if you can find the right building, if you know uh, how to actually convert it to resi under permitted development, then I think there's, there's, there's a few good opportunities in that space going forward. So, so potentially in your mind, that's, that's almost as, as good as the office to resi was yeah. in 2013. Yeah, but I, 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 I agree 100%. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at that from a personal perspective. I'm looking at those types of properties at the moment. So yeah, I, I, I'm in agree. And there's also class ZA as well, isn't there, which is, is slightly different they, buildings. Are. That's right. Yeah. So ZA is effectively, it allows you to demolish, say, say for the sake, you've got a commercial building. Uh, 10,000 square foot of commercial building. Well, Class ZA allows you to demolish that commercial building and repurpose it as residential under okay. permitted development, but it also allows you to add two additional floors on top. Uh, now, this is where you can get quite interesting because um, I'm, not too, I'm not too sure if I want to share all my little uh, all my insider knowledge here, man. I'm giving away all my all my little tip, tips in the trade here, but don't worry, I'll sh I'll share I'll share my content. It's fine. Um, so this is where it gets really interesting. So imagine if you take a uh, office building in an Article Four, you can't do anything with that building. Sure. So you can use potentially you can use Class ZA to demolish that office building, repurpose yeah. it, and add two more floors on top in an Article Four area, which where before you couldn't even do any, you couldn't convert it to resi. So that's that's one little kind of insider tip I would give someone if if they find themselves in that position. Absolutely. And and the, these are the kind of small strategies that when you can find something that suits it, then, you know, if someone doesn't realise that potential value from their perspective, and, and obviously, as you know, you want to give a win-win, so the vendor's getting the money that they want for the property, and you know there's potential value that can be achieved from the property, so therefore you're getting the uplift, the vendor's getting what they, what they perceive the property to be worth, and you're, you're creating value there, aren't you? That's, that's the kind of process. 100%. I mean, uh, we've, we've actually been really successful with joint ventures. And I'll tell you okay. part of the reason where the success comes from. It's because we have a very good system of finding off market, off, off market sites, okay. which, I'm, which I'm happy to explain if you need, if needs be. Uh, but once those letters go out, they come back, you know, we, we start, we start building a relationship with the landowner. Um, now we all, we all know that landowners for the most part, 
they want everything on the earth for 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 the land and and for the most part we as developers we struggle quite a lot to make a deal stack what i found is by joint venturing with the landowner it serves a, f a few different purposes because once you joint venture with the landowner you're not having to pay uh, you're not having to outlay a lot of the costs that you normally would have like stamp duty and and uh, and, and all that um and you're able to pay them a little bit more sure. for their land um and for the most part the joint ventures we've done we've we've actually done it in 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 a, in a way where they get their land value plus they get a split of the uplift once the planning uh, is forthcoming and also once that um, site is built out depending on what stage they want to exit but every every joint venture we put together every single one of them will want to see it through to the very end now it's fantastic for us because it just means that we don't have to we don't actually have to find the money to buy the building uh, our costs are all 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 all, all uh, reduced massively um, and from a lending perspective, it's fantastic because there is for a lot of these buildings are unencumbered, so there's no more there's no lending uh, against it. The banks like that. It means there's more there's more profit in the deal, there's more equity in the deal from day one, um, and lending is a lot easier. Plus, what I found as well is, you know, when 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 you do when, when, on day one when you need to start that development after completion, you need to come up with normally 100, 150 thousand pound in cash. To be able to front load that whole development for, until you get that first drawdown, uh, sure. which can be typically four to six weeks, um, with these unencumbered JVs that uh, what you can quite often um, set up, because there's there's money in the deal already. Um, these lenders are happy to give you that money in advance because it's just seen as another form of security against the asset. Sure. That's why I, I like these giant ventures. They're just easier to do. The, the, the vendors, the landowners, they like the idea that uh, look in another 18 months I'm going to be exiting uh, this 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 deal not only with my land value but a, like a, a chunk of change or whatever the the, the profit split is. Um, and from a lending perspective, the lenders like it as well. So you know we, we you know we've been quite uh, quite quite, uh, quite good at at, at, at tying these up over the last two years. Yeah, and and you're I think you're being a bit modest there because you you've posted on on social media, the kind of quantums of the GDV of the portfolio that you've built up, and it, it's pretty significant, right? Uh, it certainly is, yeah. <laughs> um, I try not to think of it, um, because if I, if I do, it kind of go, I, I can imagine it would go to my head. Um, I, I need to, and my, my, my goal is to have at least five or six large developments on the go in, at any one point sure. um, regardless if that's a 5 million GDV or a 25 million GDV um, uh, so yeah we the first one actually um, the first one is uh, is is a site in West London uh, in Elmbridge I, I focused quite a lot in, in around Elmbridge and Spellthorn to be fair um, purely because they're they're way behind their five year housing delivery test, um, and that's something you need, you need to be focusing on as well. When, because if you find uh, you know, there's 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 quite a few districts out there that, that are not meeting their quota, which basically means that the law, you know, you're tipping the scale in your favour when you're submitting a planning application because now they need to have a really good strong argument within the NPPF to be able to refuse you that uh, planning application. 100 so, um, percent and, a, and, a, and a, a tip here is um i think you also use them but nimbus maps have a filter on on their software whereby they, they, do, can, yeah. they can show you how how the housing delivery target is being achieved so it, when you're looking at potential target areas as as um as dave has just pointed out it's very very important to focus on those areas that haven't yet achieved their targets because those that have it's much more difficult to get planning isn't it a hundred percent it is yeah that's right and if um if they're in that kind of buffer and presumption zone uh which is that orange and red uh, uh um uh, areas that uh, matt mentioned on nimbus what happens is those councils get an extra 20 percent added on to their allocation every single year while they're behind so it gets more and more and more difficult for these councils to actually ever catch up especially if you're dealing what, what i would say is you know, look at a council and 
you know, identify are they realistically ever going to be able to catch up, you know, in the areas I focused on. A lot of it's green belt. So unless they're going to release green parts of the green belt to try and um, shore up those numbers, they're always going to be behind. And there's loads of these councils out there in, in Essex and up the country. Um, that, oh, 100%. Uh, yeah. I, I live in Hartsmere Borough, and, and in, in, in that area, they have um, literally, they are repurposing the green belt because it's council owned. And they're, yeah. you know, they're putting in a scheme for three or 4,000 houses. And it's, that is, the, in, some, in some instances, that's the only way because you've got a small um, in, 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 in kind of catchment area where the properties, and then they're circled by green belt. Yeah. And there's there's not any development opportunity, so the yeah. councils have kind of got got their arm tied behind their back in some ways, haven't they? So it makes it quite yeah. difficult. I think that's probably part part of the reason why the, the government have come out and, uh, and allowed PD to go upwards, you know, mm. you know, above office buildings and commercial properties and terrace properties, you name it, um, because it's you know if the building can structurally hold it, then there's no reason why they either can't go up at least another one or two floors. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's quite an interesting time. So, um, where were we? We were talking about the green belt. Um, what was the question, Matt? So it, it was around yeah, your your kind of your approach in oh, terms yeah, of the, the strategy. And if you yeah, could di- if you could dive into the letters as well, what you're doing there, that would be really you know. Th- and this is you know this is what I would describe in, in investment terms as some alpha here. So yeah, listen closely. <laughs> All right, yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, I was just mentioning the the sites uh, what sure. we tied up in the last year, and I'll 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 this, uh, the letters are actually. It, were absolutely crucial. I, I will say every single one of the developments we have right now, not one single one of them has come from an agent, a broker, a middleman, anything on online, uh, purely because I'm sure that your listeners will, 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 can, can relate to. Um, you could spend months, years analyzing that kind of stuff and nothing will ever come to fruition. I mean, no matter how many relationships you build with, 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 with um, um, commercial agents, and land agents most nine times out of ten they won't give you anything exclusive and it'll be just a free-for-all a bit of a frenzy and 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 and, and um yeah it's just complete waste of time and money so mm. i got disillusioned with this quite a while back so what i did was i decided there needs to be something better i basically knew that it all stems from building relationships with landowners, pure and simple, you'd just be able to tie up better deals. So the first thing I did was I went on to um, Fiverr, uh, the website, F-I-V-E-R-R, and I got myself a properly branded letter. Um, For the sake of 20 or $30, you can get someone out there to create this absolutely stunning visual and high impact uh, branded letter with your logo, colors, emails, you name it, all on there. And it just looks like it's come out of a Fortune 500 company. It really does. Then um, I got myself a copywriter, um, paid them $20, $30 dollars to, to, uh, and work with them to create a very highly well-written, highly, a good, high-quality, well-written letter um, that uh, was, going, was, was going to go on to this letter. Then I needed to find the sites. So I, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm an advocate for, for Nimbus. I absolutely love them. I've tried all every type of software out there, but Nimbus um, is the most cost-effective, the most intuitive. Um, and the fact that the, every time there's some sort of PD change or change in the use class order, they're just one step ahead. They create all these extra layers in order to help you identify like shops and uppers or office buildings or everything within classy, you name it. Um, there's actually quite a few free tools as well that, 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 that you can use on there, which will help you find off market sites like the uh, vacant building layer. Yeah. And, you know, chasing vacant buildings all day long is a nice, simple strategy. You can use the master map, which is like an OS layer. Um, the fire, it strips out all the noise and it basically shows you the uh, size of the um, the title, shows you what's on there. If there's no if there's no structure, then obviously it's a nice, it could be potentially a nice, quick, easy site for you to, to build something on if it's in a residential area. 
um, or if your strategy is maybe to find bungalows and large plots, then you can you can quite quite quickly identify all them as well. So using all these little, little tools, we started identifying quite a few um, sites, sending the letters out. Um, we use STAMP, S-T-A-N-N-P, a stamp. Um, and there's also another one called DocMail, D-O-C-M-A-I-L, DocMail. But we use STAMP for sending all our letters out. Yeah. Um, very easy to use. They're really helpful as well. So when you do send them your template, your letter, they'll actually work with you in order to kind of make sure it's resized properly, that all the text goes on and your logo's on and uh, it's all aligned properly for when the letters go out. Um, and then from there, we just, uh, at the start of COVID, I um, didn't, didn't have anyone, only myself. Um, it was perfect time really because I was quite distracted with network meetings and being on the road and, and, and what have you. So when COVID kicked in, I literally locked myself in a room for 12, 13, 14 hours a day on Nimbus. A complete nerd. I was an absolute complete nerd. Uh, I will hold my hands up. Um, I do actually enjoy it for some reason. Uh, so I know some people hate side finding, but I absolutely love the challenge of measuring out gardens, finding what I can build there, looking at an, an office building. Can I get some extra floors there? Maybe looking at a, a terrace row of commercial properties, see what I can do there. Um, or even some land assembly, garden assembly, you name it. And um, yeah, so towards the end of last year, we started getting quite a lot of traction because you know I was, uh, I was I was putting out five, six, seven hundred letters uh, a month and the low compound effect. Wow, H hang on. So just one second, I'm interrupting you and I do apologize for that. 500 letters per month. Oh yeah, I think one month I did 900. Wow. And, and I think this is the thing for people that, you know, want to get into this thing. If you send one letter, you, you should not be expecting to get one no. response, right? And, and what, so what kind of response rate do you get? Do you know what? Everyone asks me that question. It's really hard to, to, to quantify because there's times where I'm, uh, I, I sent out five, uh, no, 150 letters in one week. And then, yeah. and then the following week, I had like, something like seven or eight people come back and I think three of them turned into deals and I've also been in the position where I've sent out 500 letters and I've only got one or two two phone calls it's really hard to quantify and then you know I put out maybe another 500 and you might not get any phone calls but then the next 500 that goes out I might have 30 phone calls in that month in that month and I know part of that is from the, the two other months that have come with prior to that sure. all those leads have uh, I've, I've kind of accumulated in, into one really good kind of productive month. I will say something I've had to learn, uh, I've learned, which is just because I find the side, because I send out a letter, you know, time-wise, for me, I want everything yesterday. You know, I'm keen to do a deal right now, but you've got to remember it's about the landowner's requirements, their circumstances, their timeline. You know, I've had one that, that came in uh, the end of last week, and it was in an area I hadn't focused on for at least six, seven, eight months. And I said, how long have you had this letter? And he said, yeah, it's been in my, um, it's been in my drawer for about eight months. I just haven't got around to it, but now it's, it's good timing. You know, it's coming up to Christmas. We do need some money. So, uh, and funny enough, last year, it was a similar situation where I'd sent a letter out um, probably around September, October time. And I got a, I got a phone call the second week back in January, and he said, um, Dave, my wife's been on at me all over Christmas about this land. We need to sell it now. Your letter has come at the right time. What do you want to do? So it, 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 it is that thing. And it really uh, is. The, 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 first, the first podcast that I did was with Lloyd Girardi, and he said oh, something yeah. in that that reminded, you know, every time I, I, I hear about this kind of activity, and it's very simple. It's activity creates opportunity. Um, and and I, I get the same. I get people ringing me. Oh, you sent me a letter two years ago and yeah. they've kept the letter. They've filed it away. And, and, and actually what I think is going on, and I, I don't know if you agree with this, but from a macro perspective, the kind of baby boomer generation are beginning to retire. And with COVID and everything that's going on, lots of these people that are owner, owner operators of businesses and, and also have large, large houses with bigger plots 
are beginning to think actually, you know, they want their day on the beach in the Bahamas or whoever takes their fancy. And this is potentially a way of them achieving that. So, and, and I think actually what we're seeing is a kind of generational shift of assets from the, you know, the, the, the people in their kind of 60s, 70s downward to, a, to another generation. And I think that's where if you can add some value in those, in those opportunities, it, it potentially creates a really win-win situation for the, for the landowner and, and, and obviously for the, for the developer. Matt, I've, I couldn't agree more. I've, I've seen, especially uh, with some of the Class E stuff, yeah. um, there's, been, um, there's been nurseries that have closed up and there was uh, shops and uppers that kind of shut down and never reopened. Um, and that was in their family for like maybe two or, two or three generations. And now they've come to a stage where they're not going to pass it on anymore because you know, the business uh, isn't viable anymore. So they just want to sell it. So... Mm. I mean, that's why I, I, I genuinely think right now where we are in this current time is probably by far the best opportunity we're ever, ever likely to have. That's probably, I would say, maybe failing that was probably after the World War where they, the country needed to rebuild everything. Mm -hmm. This is probably the second, well, this, by, this is the, the biggest change since the planning system was set, set up in the 40s. Mm. We've never seen this this type of change to the planning system. It's created all these opportunities. COVID has completely changed um, how people view holding assets, you know, commercial asset, assets, which historically were a far more safer investment than residential because you could put a tenant in there, sign a, a 20 or 30 um, uh, repairing lease, mm. and then just sit and forget about it. That's completely changed. And, you know, if I was to ask you what is a, a double or a triple a type a class tenant now you know it's very hard to identify what that is mm. so you know wh wh whether you're looking for commercial to resi where you're looking for pd to go upwards if you're looking to assemble something you know the you know the government the council have, have made it a lot easier now to, to try and take advantage of these opportunities and yeah you know there's there's been a lot of changes in these these vendor circumstances you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. The one I just mentioned, um, he, he he's looking for, uh, to release some money now. It's believe it or not, it's actually when I asked him the question, how long has he owned the asset? He said, Dave, it's been in our family over a hundred years, wow. and I said, well, I need to know now how you know what what is how is how is this possible? He said to Dave, uh, we are, I, I'm I'm a third generation contractor. Uh, my dad was one, and my 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 my, my, my granddad, and uh, effectively we had this building uh, yard for, for 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 the last hundred plus years. Um, I'm I've come up to retirement. I don't have any children to pass it on. It's just been rented out, and um, you know we'd rather just uh, re you know release that equity now and you know retire comfortably. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's amazing. We, like you were saying, all these changes in these people's circumstances now has created this abundance of opportunities that weren't there before and and for someone who is beginning beginning this process and you know we're talking about you know potentially larger sites and bigger things how what would your advice to be for someone who was just getting started and is just learning about this maybe you know not maybe not for the first time but is early in that life cycle um don't get sidetracked uh, uh on one particular type of thing like i did with the office to resi I spent probably two years of my life chasing uh, this this golden egg, um, and it and it wasn't there. And funny enough, when I started to diversify into looking at other things like the land assembly, the garden assembly, the commercial to to resi and and repurposing all that, I, f I found that I did actually uh, find a few more office buildings that did stack. Um, mm. Um, like I said, COVID's been qu quite an interesting one. If you did still want to just pursue office buildings, it, it might be a good time to actually get back into it now because a lot of people um, have broken their leases. Um, you know, they haven't come back after COVID or they do need to downside because half the workforce is probably still working at home. So mm -hmm. I, still, I still think that that probably presents quite a good opportunity over the next um, couple of years. Um, don't be put off by starting. A lot of people think, well, I need the experience, so I'll start later. You can borrow the experience. You can join venture with people. People get put off by money. I promise you, don't be put off by money because there is an abundance of money out there. Family, friends, 
um, networking groups. Uh, I know it's a bit cliche. I've heard, I genuinely have, have heard this so many times, but I'm an advocate, you know, I've seen, it in, uh, I've seen it in play now, I've seen how easy it is to raise finance. Um, and I would say uh, you would need to, so don't pressify, don't be put off by the money, don't buy, um, also don't limit you, yourself to thinking, well, I, you know, I, I'm quite new, I, I only need to look at one or two or three unit sites. If you're borrowing the credibility and they've got, they've done larger skills and schemes, then you can probably look at, you know, doing five to 10 units. Don't go too mad too quick because obviously you don't really have too much of a track record and it's all about you know, the banks looking at you and seeing what you've done before or what your business partner's done before and what you've actually borrowed. But look, I, 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 I'm currently doing a 52 unit deal uh, wow. as one of the, it's, uh, big. it's big yeah it's uh 20 i think it's 23 and a half million gdv um th i think it's about 30 houses and 26 apartments that we've finally decided on um that's a land assembly i've put together and it's a little bit more complicated it is in the green belt um but uh, i'm dealing with a council that haven't hit their targets i've submitted it through the core sites i'm actually liaising with them now because they need to they need to hit their numbers so um, you know, we, we will deliver it. It'll just take a couple of years for me to get the planning. It'll take three years for me to build it out. But have I got experience doing 52? No, I haven't. Um, have the people I've put together got that, that experience? Yes. Mm. Um, and so, so, there is so, so, to, so, sorry, to clarify that. So what you're just reading between the lines, you're saying that you're joint venturing with the landowner and then you're also joint venturing with the contractor as well, who will deliver yeah. deliver the scheme. So yeah. effectively, you're acting in as as the kind of intermediary, the deal maker, um, and, yeah. pull, and and also you're 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 putting some of your own money in these things, I assume. But you're raising capital from from investors for them as well, are you? Is that is that is that right uh, to say? So uh, yes, um, on some of the deals, some of the deals I, I've actually put no money in, and they're multi million pound deals. Um, sure. So the landowners wow. put the land in. I've got 100% development finance yeah. um, because the property is unencumbered. I've managed to get uh, agree a deal where the lenders also uh, agreed to put in another 160,000 on day one for me to cash flow this for the first six weeks. So right. effectively, so, so, so eff effectively, you, you've drawn up some legal agreements. Yeah. So, so and you found the site and you've done yeah. done some planning work on it before before it before it comes to yeah. cut comes to structuring a deal. But effectively, yeah. you know, say that's what ten grand, ten grand all in, something like that, maybe twenty. Yeah, yeah, not um, even that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 then you've got something. You you've then created an equitable stake in in that transaction for yourself that's worth you know several hundreds of thousands of pounds, yeah. maybe more. Um, yeah. I'll give you a prime a prime example actually, one that um, it's been ongoing for a little while, but effectively I found the site. Um, in West London, uh, she had a failed planning application on it because she had tried to do this. Uh, she had a, a nursery building uh, that was closed down. It wasn't viable anymore. She joint ventured with a, a developer who, to be fair, without talking bad about someone, he didn't do what he should have done. He should have got a planner on board. He thought he had some planning knowledge and he he instructed an architect to do the drawings and the planning work, and mm. the architect wasn't skillful enough to be able to do the, the planning. So they submitted the planning application. It got failed because um, they didn't address the community use aspect of the building. Right. Um, I, using my planning knowledge, I knew it was fixable because I knew that it wouldn't be D1 anymore. Uh, when the new use class order came out, it would fall within class E, then that community aspect would dissipate once you've done your change of use. Uh, so you could change it from once it, well, it's in, in class E. Once we did our change of use, we converted it straight to an office. So then you know, the whole community use is gone. So then that allowed us to, to go back in for full planning. So I did a pre app first purely because I knew that uh, it was a bit complicated. I wanted to get to the council on site uh, and on board. Uh, and agree to a scheme so they can change their old way of thinking about the site, which which was a refusal. Um, my planner also gave me a really good piece of advice. He said, go political. So what that means is try and rope in some um, local councillors. So I emailed three local councillors that I knew were on the planning. 
Right. And um, I've built up a really good relationship with them. All three of them want support, a support planning application as well now. So um, the the way I structure it with the with, with the with the vendor is she got her uh, her her land value, which we agreed to, plus a fifty percent um, stake once the um, once the site's built out. So there is um, there is over seven hundred thousand in uh, profit. Uh, which is well in excess of a 20% profit in GDV. Um, and she's getting her land value plus uh, 350,000 odd um, for just staying in the deal, basically. You know, she, 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 she's not really a property person. So she's using my skill set when it comes to planning and my knowledge and my contacts and my relationships with banks and whatever. You, um, you know, anyone who, anyone who is anyone can actually do all this themselves as well. It's not, it's not that complicated. And, and the thing that I really like about what you're doing is you are, cre- you know, and I think this for me is really important because there's, you know, sometimes there's, should we say, less ethical developers that try and steamroll their way into things. But what you're trying to achieve is actually create a win-win-win. So you're winning, the council are winning, you know, the, the, the landowners is getting more than, more than the asking price potentially yeah. on occasion, yeah. which obviously means from their perspective, you know, you want, you want to end these things with a feel-good factor, don't you? And if, if they can see you've done well out of it, but they've also got more than they were expecting, then th- there can't be any complaints at the end of that process, can there? Exactly, yeah. So the, the owner, like I said, she's not a property person. So she's got a field planning, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, that, that property would just be left. I mean, it's been deteriorating for three years already before I came on, on the case. So it would just be left to rot there unless someone, mm-hmm. someone else came to uh, and approached her. Um, the 52 unit scheme that, that involves three people, but two, two effectively within the SPV who, who are putting the land in. And then the third person is putting a, a strip of land in to create the access We've got a signed agreement with him. Um, these are just all JVs. These are all kind of win-win for people. One of the two landowners, he's coming up, he's retired, so he doesn't want to be doing this in his 70s. So um, the other chap, the other landowner has got some deep pockets. So he's agreed to buy him out. And once uh, it'll just leave myself and the other guy in, we'll both build it out together. and We'll just both split it 50-50. Yeah. Um, Again, the one, the, the other one I mentioned, uh, you might have seen that uh, twenty-unit scheme. Um, that's with two landowners. They've got two large gardens. Uh, effectively, we're going to knock down the two houses, and we've got a scheme of twenty apartments uh, on that site, um, which the council. Funny enough, there is something called a Schlaw list, S H L A A. Yeah. Um, and these, this is a list within the council. Every council should have a Schlaw list. And on this list is sites they've earmarked and they've designated that they would like to see developed. Um, now, the reason this is on this list is because about 14, 15 years ago, someone approached them, got planning, got the consent, but never built it out because I guess maybe the deal fell apart and he couldn't raise all the money. So the council knew that it was a site capable of X amount of properties on there. Um, and every year they've wrote to the two homeowners saying, are you actually ever going to do, do, you know, build this out? What are you looking to do with it? I came across it by chance, built a relationship with them, and we've decided a joint venture. They're putting the land in. I'm going to develop it out. But, you know, it, it's, it's simple once you know. It really is. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, as, as you evolve more of these kind of you know little strategies each one you know you you can obviously identify more sites that meet meet that criteria as well and kind of rinse and rinse and repeat as well um in, in terms of mistakes that you've made on this journey is there any mistakes that you've made and what would you do differently if if, if anything oh mistakes uh mistakes probably like i said chasing uh, being too focused on one thing uh sure. When I opened up my eyes to looking at anything and everything, um, you know, the airspace, the new change of use order, the garden, uh, the garden and the land assembly, that's where I, I found, I mean, looking across everything we're working on right now, we're at, there's, a, there's, there's like a mixture of everything. You know, we've got some PD stuff, we've got some airspace stuff, we've got some just normal uh, land assembly stuff that we've put together. Um, so... I would say look at anything and everything. Um, build up your list of contacts and uh, network contacts and your investor pool. 
uh, as quickly as possible. Don't get too focused. I actually, at the beginning, they all say, well, do I need to find the money first or do I need to find the site? So I actually went looking for the money first and then found the money. Then we're looking for sites, but it's not def it's very difficult to find sites. By the time I found the site and went back to the money, the money was gone because obviously they, they wanted that money to be, you know, earning more money for them. So what I did then was just find the site and the money together. Um, what the best advice I'll give you is uh, I was kind of chasing the, the shiny penny everywhere. So when everyone gave me a, a deal or a site, a potential site, I just looked at it no matter what area it was. Um, John, my planner, gave me the best advice. He says, Dave, just get purely focused on one area. Um, and then, you know, I'm not too, I live, I don't live too far from West London. So, uh, I literally just got really laser focused and started idea identifying everything, you know, getting Nimbus out, looking at the OS layers, the garden assembly, measuring stuff out, um, the PD stuff, the vacant buildings, the leases expiring, you name it. And I promise you looking at all the sites we have now, they're all within a, I would say probably no, no more than a four or five mile radius. And there's wow. about, so there's about, that's, that's, that's a really small concentration, isn't it? Yeah. We've, we've got about, I think about nine developments right now, all at different, uh, different uh, stages. They're all within a four or five mile radius. I, I, I can imagine the council are going to be like, Oh God, here he comes again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. You know, yeah. um, you can't, you can't really, genuinely know a council, build a relationship. If you're looking at every single council. Um, so look, um, there's something called the local plan. Yep. Identify a good area, make sure it's profitable. Also one thing, make sure that um, you're working in a high pound per square foot area, because if you're in an area that is the, the resales is only going to be 300 pound a square foot, but your bill cost is going to be 180. And you still have to buy it, make a profit and pay for all the mm -hmm. finance, everything else. You're not going to be making any money. What I tend to do is focus in areas that normally have 500 to 550 pound a square foot yeah. as a minimum, purely yeah. because then I know all the costs will be covered and it's easier to tie up a deal. It's easier to pay a little bit more for the land. I know all the bill costs will be covered and you can make a decent profit. Um, so get focused in an area and in, within certain areas, not the, the whole area isn't just 550 pound per square foot. The good thing about Nimbus is once you open up the pound per square foot layer, uh, it tells you exactly the parts of that area that will generate 500 pound or the parts of that area that will generate 400 pound a square foot. Basically, it's telling you the good bits and the bad bits of the town without you having to go there. Yeah, hundred percent, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, so get a good area, work in an area that's going to be um, uh, good enough for you to to be able to do a development. Build those relationships. Don't be uh, uh, worried about. Look, I don't have the experience. Because if I if I did if I literally was worried about every single thing. Um, that would stop me doing development. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even make a start now. I was worried about the money, the experience, the knowledge, but you have to make a start somewhere. Get well, and, and, knowledge and, and the fact, the fact is, Dave, as, as you know, you can secure a site under, a, you know, either an option agreement, a joint venture yeah. without yeah. putting too much money down. And then you can yeah. sell it to another developer. Right. So you, you don't actually have to build these things out and you can still, you know, if, if you get a good planning consultant, you can still generate a profit just by going through that process, let alone the construction phase. Can't you? I mean, it, 100%. It, it is difficult to exit. And I will caveat that, that fine. You know, when you've got a clock that's ticking and an option agreement that's due to expire, you know, from from personal experience, that pro process can be complicated and it can be very stressful, but you can exit that. That's that's the point. There is, there, I mean, you don't have to build everything out. Luckily for us now, we're at a stage where we have enough in the pipeline. We can build out half, we could sell half if we wanted to. Yeah. We're actually, um, we, we've, we, we're we working with a very well-known housing association okay. who want to take some of the larger schemes. Um, funny enough, next door to the 52-unit scheme, we're just putting a land assembly together, which involves three landowners. And that is a 66 acre site, which will generate um, roughly around 250 houses. And the housing association want that site 
together with the 52 unit one as well. So you don't, and, 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 the, and they're willing to give an option as well. And they're willing to pay me for my time for just tying this up. So you don't actually, you know, you don't need to build everything out and it's good for cash flow as well. If you have stuff that, you know, it's going to generate cash flow on a, you know, regular basis. Um, Absolutely. Well, that, that's been a really interesting kind of insight into, into the things that you do. In terms of from a personal perspective, how, how do you maintain your focus? Because obviously you've got a lot going on. You've got lots of inquiries and deals work you're working on at any time. So is, is there any activities that you participate in to keep yourself grounded and on, on track? Um, I've learned to outsource a lot more than uh, I'm always one that was very reluctant to give it, uh, you know, that, that's, that stuff away because I thought, you know, there's, there's no one out there who can do it better than me, but I was quite fortunate. You know, I've, I've recruited some amazing people from the Philippines uh, and outsourced a huge amount of the site finding and even the deal analysis, you know, I've got deal analyzers that analyze the deals, people f- find the sites and, you know, uh, all that. So I've managed to buy, buy, buy back an awful lot of my time. Um, I was never really into my health and fitness, but luckily uh, a friend of mine, Des, who he's got me into cycling. Uh, so we've been cycling every Saturday uh, 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 throughout COVID. Okay, um, yeah, Mr. Daly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, yeah. yeah. And um, he's got me into golf as well. So we've, we've put together a, a nice little bunch of people. There's no... There's normally about maybe 30, 20 or 30 property people, investors, developers, funders, you name it. We all, we all go out. We all kind of work together. Funny enough, one of the, I'll, I'll tell you how, how, how this works. Um, Des put me in a four ball recently. Um, one of the, ch- and, and I didn't think anything of it until recently, until I got a phone call and uh, they said, Dave, uh, we want to work with you on a site. I said, okay, fair enough. One of the four balls, found the site the other chap in the four ball is funding all the equity right i'm the delivery guy yeah and then the other guy um, um maybe um we, we, he's he's going to be the uh, debt portion he's a broker so he's going to be funding all the debt uh, the debt side of it so between the four of us we found it we funded it and we're going to be delivering it and wow. that and, that, and funny enough we've got two schemes uh, and one of them has just been uh, one of them is for a 20 unit scheme that we just got accepted on Friday. Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah. So, yeah, networking, networking is definitely the way forward. But from, from a health perspective, yeah, cycling, um, trying to get into the gym, get, you know, uh, has it, been really crucial. Um, do, and, do, you, do you still do, obviously, Tony Robbins and you, you mentioned yeah. that earlier on. Do you, do you carry out the kind of visualization side of things still? Is that something that's in your routine? Um, I do. I don't always do it. But what I, what I, what I have done that, that gives me a bit of motivation and spurs me on is on Facebook. You can join up to all these kind of motivational um, Facebook groups. Hmm. And people are constantly posting really positive things like uh, little quotes from, say, Jim Rowan. Yeah. Um, now, Jim Rowan was uh, Tony Robbins' mentor. Mm. Um, in fact, what I'd, what, what I'd like to share one little piece of advice. If anyone here has got Audible, go on to Audible, and Jim, you can actually download for one credit the whole of Jim Rowan's library, all his talks, all his seminars, and it's probably, I don't know, maybe I don't know, 10, 12, 13 hours worth of content. Wow. I promise you. It's the best one credit, the best Audible you'll ever, ever listen to. And if you're looking for a mentor and you can't afford one, there's no better one than Jim, Jim Rowan because he talks about everything. He talks about health, well-being, fitness, money, mindset, property, investing. You will get something from it because he covers everything. Mm. So, yeah, I do. I, you know, I, I, I try and net my time. So, I mean, if I'm in a car driving to development or a meeting, I try and put on a podcast or, yeah. or, or an Audible uh, if I'm on the treadmill, I'll try and put some um, earphones uh, uh, on and listen to an audible and uh, yeah, try and keep up my, with the golf and, and the fitness, really. That's, that's, that's my thing that's keeping me sane, really, at the moment. No, exactly. I think, yeah, well, we've all been through a slightly strange couple of years and it's, 
yeah, have, having those kind of activities which have an element of socialism, so, socialization to them, not socialism, sorry, socialization yeah. to them. Um, but they're, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, just just down the pub as we, as we all used to. Um, I think that's pro- probably not not such a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. No, good. Well, look, it's been really interesting talking to you. I know you've got another another call shortly, so um, we'll we'll let you go on your way. But just 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 finally, do you have any um, closing remarks? And also, where can we find you on socials, um, etc., and your website? Um, yeah, you're more than welcome to to reach out to me. Um, I've I've got a website, Mom Baton Estates. Um, we've all, I'm also on. Nearly every social media. You can reach out to me on Facebook or Facebook Messenger uh, or contact the office. Um, I do like helping and sharing my advice and knowledge and experience as much as I can. Um, that's why I used to do uh, a lot of, net- I used to run quite a lot of networking uh, events to, to try and bring these contacts together. Sure. Um, in order to help people, and what I've done recently is set up a, uh, a VA site finding service so we actually uh what i want to replicate my success my, my you know my system will for other people sure. so what i've done is uh we offer a service where we actually re- recruit uh, train onboard vas we train them up it's actually about there's about a, a month's worth of content finding off-market de- uh, sites and developments mm-hmm. training them up on crms and nimbus and you name it and then effectively you got a, a rock star uh, site finder at the end of this which will be working with the developer um, and they'll probably typically find you know two three four hundred sites a month for you in, interesting uh, i didn't know i didn't know you did because I, I actually have done something similar so i've got a guy in india who's that now training oh, up yeah. other people as well so yeah. <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but and then, but, it, but as as you said uh, sorry sorry to interrupt but as you said right. earlier it, it kind of it takes that bit of a task off your desk it and does. then you just review the ones that are good, right? So you, you don't 100%. have to go through them all. Yeah. And the system now revolves and then uh, them finding the, the deals. Um, they're actually capable of, of reviewing the site. They don't need to go through the list anymore. They sure. send all the letters out. And then the first I know about it is when someone contacts me uh, on my phone or they actually call the office or they send an email in saying, look, Dave, we've got your letter about this site. And then it's me just taking over Quite, quite a nice warm lead which is quite a good position no to be exactly exactly and it's just ma- maintaining it if you are starting that focus or you've started and stopped i think you know, the thing that you mentioned earlier i think for me is a key takeaway it's just maintaining that consistency with the, even if it's 10 letters a week or 20 letters a week but just yeah. having that consistent approach because these people will come back to you and it might not be when you want them to but they will come back to you sooner or later 100 percent, yeah and one more thing I'm quite proud about as well. I haven't done it all along purely because I didn't have the time to be able to do it. But like I mentioned to you before, I brought back an awful lot of my time over the last year by recruiting and training these people. So um, we, I, I personally mentor people as well. Uh, so okay. I help them how to site find and I help them how to structure these deals. And I introduce them to my equity people and my debt people um and they've obviously got access to to all my professionals um so you know where they find a deal and they need help structuring or going out and having a conversation with the landowner that's where i step in as well and and go out with them and and help them tie up these deals and you know it's 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 been really successful so so far so if anyone's got any help or need any advice on that front then feel free to reach out to me Okay, awesome. Well, look, it's been a really interesting insight. And yeah, as, as I said at the outset, you know, what you've achieved is incredible. So congratulations. I really, you know, really mean that it's great to see, you know, the, the acceleration that you've put on. And I know how hard it is to go through that process. Yeah. So what you've done, something quite special. Um, and yeah, I, I, finally, you know, what, what's the plan, plan for the future? You know, how, how, how big are you going to get? How big are we going to get? Well, we... The, we were actually on target to deliver um, in around 500 properties within five years. Wow. Uh, we've, uh, the pipeline as it stands at the moment is um, we've got, not, not including the 52 unit one and the, the 251, um, which we were working with the HA on, but if we kept that out of the loop, I think we've got 
uh, in excess of 100 properties, well, when it, well, in excess of 100 properties across the other sites that we're working on right now. So, yeah, I think we're well, uh, we're definitely going to be achieving that 500 within five years target. Uh, I won't stop until I achieve it. Awesome. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, I really appreciate your time. And, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Nice to catch up. Lovely. Thank you very much. Invite me, Matt. Cheers. Thanks for listening to The Growth Show with Matt Lindsay. Please like our podcast and subscribe today.